Good afternoon. I, I just landed a few hours ago from uh, DC and I learned upon arriving this uh, terrible crash of uh, the Polish presidential plane. That's really terrible news. I was in Poland two weeks ago and met some of these people in the office. So I'm shocked and I think you will join me in saying that all our thoughts uh, are with the people of Poland. Now, it's nevertheless a great pleasure to be with you here and take part um, in this conference of the Institute of New uh, Economic Thinking. The reason why I'm here, in a nutshell, is that I do believe that the uh, stronger connection relationship between uh, academia and policymakers are absolutely needed and even more looking forward than it was in the past. And that uh, most of uh, the problem that we may, we policymakers, I mean, I'm now on this side, even if you are kind enough to re remind uh, us with some uh, academia work, academic work, um, the mo most of the problem we have is the difficulty to incorporate new thinking and new analysis in the way we try to help countries to manage their economy. So the more you will be able to think about new problems, the more we will be able to understand and to take this on board, the better it will be for the, the global e economy. As we all know, this crisis uh, led to uh, some kind of a great recession and has inflicted a tremendous uh, economic and social damage to, across the, the world. And uh, the costs are huge, low growth, uh, high unemployment, debt, and we all know also that it will take uh, many years to overcome. But we have learned something more from this crisis, namely that uh, some weaknesses in the economic and financial uh, policy framework uh, were so important that uh, we cannot uh, go back to business as usual, uh, even if the crisis is not totally over. It will be over in, uh, hopefully, in uh, a rather short period of time. And then there is a big risk that everybody will come back and say, okay, crisis behind us, let's go back to the way we managed things before. But I think that uh, it's fair to say that our confidence in markets and in institutions turned out to be uh, complacency and that uh, we learned during this crisis how fallible we are, how fragile and how interconnected we are. So now that we emerge from the immediate crisis response period, I think really that it's time to draw lessons, or at least to begin to draw lessons. And the IMF is contributing to this effort as it has been reflected in some uh, recent publication on macroeconomic policy, on uh, capital controls, which was not expected from the IMF, on uh, climate policy or other topic like this. Just to show you that uh, we are also trying to be able to think out of the, of the box. Today i like to focus on, on, three, on three, three problems, three questions. Agree the need of uh, coordination between monetary policy and, and financial regulation, a need for fiscal adjustment and for better uh, fiscal stabilizer, and uh, the importance of international policy cooperation. Let me begin with a brief, uh, brief discussion, uh, this description on the pre-crisis uh, consensus uh, as it relates to uh, monetary policy, uh, uh, fiscal policy uh, and financial regulation. First, monetary policy. Low and stable inflation was considered as primary, if not exclusive, mandate of central banks. That was clearly the consensus. And after the high inflation in the 70s, central bankers were keen to be tough on inflation. This position was given some uh, intellectual uh, rigor by the new Keynesian model, namely that uh, constant inflation uh, is the optimal policy choice uh, for keeping economic growth at the potential uh, rate. So keeping inflation low and stable was seen as the best way to secure optimal uh, economic performance. Second, on the fiscal side. 
decades, in decades preceding the crisis, fiscal policy had uh, taken a, a back seat uh, to monetary policy for, for various reasons. One is certainly uh, skepticism about effect of uh, fiscal policy based on a different kind of Ricardian equivalence arguments. Second, concerns about the lags and policy influences in designing and implementing uh, fiscal policy. Third, the reason the need to stabilize uh, and possibly to reduce in many countries significantly or typically high debt levels. And fourth, and that's an important thing for the future, the idea that the automatic stabilizer were considered sufficient to allow fiscal policy to respond. And then the third pillar was on, uh, after monetary policy and fiscal policy, was on fin financial regulation and supervision. And the focus was on the soundness of institutions and markets aimed at correcting markets' failures stemming from asymmetric information or limited liability. But macro implication of the financial sector risks were largely ignored. And even more, the use of prudential rules for cyclical purposes was considered as a really an improper interference in the functioning of credit market. So for about a quarter of a century, this macroeconomic framework seemed to deliver. And the so-called uh, great moderation lulled us into believing that uh, we knew how to conduct macroeconomic policy. On top of that, or in addition, successful responses to the uh, 87 uh, uh, stock market crash, to uh, LTCM collapse, to the bursting of the tech bubble, reinforced the view that the monetary policy was also well equipped to deal with asset price bubbles. Thus, in the midst of uh, Mid-2000s, it was not unreasonable to think better, that better macroeconomic policy uh, could deliver and had delivered higher economic stability. Admittedly, these views were more closely held in academia. Policymakers were more pragmatic. Nevertheless, the prevailing consensus played an important role in shaping policies and, and institutions. Uh, success in moderating fluctuations may even have helped sow the seeds of this crisis. And I do believe that the so-called uh, great moderation led many, or too many, to underestimate macroeconomic risk and, in particular, to ignore tail risks. Then came the crisis. And the question is, what have we learned from the crisis? I think we learned that threats to macroeconomic and financial stability may develop beneath a seemingly tranquil surface of stable prices, uh, small output gaps, and healthy public finance. I think we learned, too, that um, regulatory, regulatory weaknesses have allowed significant risk to build up and have also enabled the US, US uh, housing bubble to turn into a, a major crisis. And what we learned also is that uh, once the crisis started, rules aimed at guaranteeing the soundness of individual institution worked against the stability of the system. I have in mind, of course, the so-called uh, mark-to-market rules, coupled with a constant uh, regulatory capital ratio, which forced a uh, financial institution into fire sales and deleveraging. So, while many tenets of the pre-crisis consensus, namely low inflation and fiscal discipline, uh, remain valid 
others need to be reconsidered. So let's try to say a few words first on monetary policy. What, what are the lessons for monetary policy? Even before the crisis, has been a lively debate whether interest rate rule, either implicit or explicit, should be extended to deal with asset prices. In my view, it's the wrong way to, of approaching the problem. I think that the policy rate is a poor tool to deal with uh, excess leverage and risk taking. But on the contrary, policymakers have other instruments at their disposal, and I think we could call them uh, cyclical regulatory tools. Liquidity ratio, capital ratio to address leverage, loan to value ratio to address housing prices, and margin requirements to address stock prices. So why won't we use this kind of tool and others, I'm, I'm not pretending that this list is, is a closed list, to try to be able to add to the traditional tool which, uh, which was uh, considered as being almost a unique one, namely the, the, the policy rate. What we learn also is that um, the use of monetary and regulatory tools together raises the issue of coordination between monetary and regulatory uh, authorities. And uh, during the crisis, we learned that uh, this can raise significant challenges. Think, for example, this country is to, of, the, to the, of the example of Northern Rock, which clearly uh, part of the problem was this coordination between these two kind of authorities. You told me. Let them in. Well, let's go on. A final point on monetary policy. Um, whether targeting higher inflation could leave more room to lower interest rate. This idea has been floated by my good friend and uh, uh, colleague in the IMF, Olivier Blanchard. And I think really that it's an interesting idea that merits a serious discussion. But even if it's a good idea that we could discuss, uh, my point this morning is that we remain an institution that believes that low and stable inflation, in most cases, delivers uh, positive benefits for growth and, uh, and macro stability. So, uh, research in one thing, discussions in one thing, and we have to go on on this question and discuss more on the possibility of uh, uh, having anchoring anticipation at another level than the traditional one. It doesn't mean that so far the IMF has changed uh, his view. What's your point? Who told you that? That's an old IMF you're talking about. You should read the press. Should we go on? Good. Another point I wanted to, to make was not on, on monetary policy, but on fiscal policy. The crisis has placed uh, the concyclical fiscal uh, policy back at center stage. So our thing, I'm trying to say, <laughs> that the crisis had put uh, this uh, kind of a counter-cyclical fiscal policy at center stage, and I'm proud to say that uh, the Fed has played a pivotal role in doing this. So maybe some of you do remember that uh, as soon as January 2008, we asked for this uh, fiscal stimulus, thing that the downturn in the global economy would really be, be strong. Uh, but what's the key lesson from this? 
The lesson is that uh, you have really to build some uh, fiscal space in good times if you want to be able, without too, much, too many damages, to use this uh, tool in, in time of, of, of crisis. What does it mean? In advanced economies, the average ratio of debt to GDP before the crisis was 75%. Our forecast is that by 2014, it will be 110. So that's 35% in increase. Out of which, by the way, only 3% comes from the stimulus. The rest comes from the effect of a downturn on the fiscal situation of countries. But nevertheless, you have this increase of 35%. And so it means that uh, for the next decade or two, cyclical up upswings would need to be at least partly used to reduce the public debt and not all totally used to finance expenditures or, or tax cut. And the fact that we have to come back to more sustainable uh, debt to GDP ratio is something that in most countries, not all of them, but most countries, we, we shouldn't forget after, after the crisis. But the last point I want to make on, on, on fiscal policy is the one I uh, uh, announced earlier. I'm not going to elaborate too much on it. But it's the fact that uh, the crisis also reminded us that uh, uh, discretionary measures typically come too late. And so that we need to improve the automatic stabilizer. We cannot rely on them if we are not able to put in place policies that will automatically uh, step in as soon as uh, growth is declining or whatever the index you, you choose. There are many tools that we can imagine, uh, helping the most vulnerable in the society, providing a tax cut to a low-income part of the, uh, the consumer just to boost consumption. There's a different way to do it. I'm not going to elaborate on this, but improving the way automatic stabilizer may be helpful is something which certainly is part of the research we have to, to make and to the policy we have to, to implement. Then, let me go rapidly to the third field after, after monetary policy and fiscal policy, which is uh, the critical importance of international economic cooperation. Many, 18 months ago, maybe many of you, had in mind that uh, we could face something as big as the Great Depression, and they were right. We avoided it. We didn't avoid the crisis altogether. We had some crisis, but we avoided something so far which was uh, comparable to the Great Depression. And the reason, one, uh, for me, the biggest reason, for maybe the real, the most important reason for me, is that we contemplate an unprecedented, unparalleled degree of economic cooperation. Uh, almost all the countries having some fiscal, room, fiscal rooms and sometimes some not having this fiscal room came together facing the same problem at the same time using the same tool and do it in a rather coordinated way. And certainly this consensus delivered. The problem of course is will the consensus last after the crisis or will all uh, leaders come back to their domestic problem, which is politically understandable, but certainly economically ineffective? That's the big question. But at least it's clear that this economic coordination in putting in place the stimulus, the support to the banking sector, has been very uh, uh, effective. And I do believe that in the post-crisis era, it will be even more necessary to have this kind of uh, coordination. I recently spoke about this in, in Central Europe, uh, in the context of Europe. And certainly in the context of Europe, we have this, we see this problem clearly, that the launching of the EU, you were recalling uh, 10 years ago, uh, was only a first step. And the idea, very much debated at this time, that uh, you can't have a single currency without having a more coordinated uh, economic policy, and that you need to make the second step, this idea has been discussed a lot, but not so much implemented. It was what the idea which was at the roots of the Eurogroup, which has been the result of a big fight between the French and the German at this time, but the Eurogroup itself is not enough. And you need something which makes the economic policy more coordinated, and obviously the institutions in place today are, are not enough to do this. Uh, the idea of a European fund has been floating, I would call it better, rather a European budgetary fund than monetary fund because it had nothing to do with monetary fund, but a European budgetary fund aimed to 
help countries to stabilize their economy in the short term is some, certainly something that will be needed to have this bigger cooperation. But it's also true at the global scale. And what the G20 is trying to build, the so-called uh, mutual assessment program, where countries are given to the IMF, which is providing the technical assistance for this, their forecast for the coming years, and we're trying to put this together and see if it has some uh, inconsistency or not, probably it has, and if not, uh, and if it has what kind of policy have to be implemented to, to correct it, this exercise, which is underway, is in my view very important. The first, uh, we will deliver the first round of this at the spring meeting, at the G20 meeting, which takes place uh, at the spring meeting of the IMF in, at the end of this month, and the second run will be for the head of state at the, in, in June, it's an attempt to have coordination is probably too strong a word, but at least an attempt to see together what kind of problem we're facing and try to find solution, which is the beginning of a, of a kind of a, a coordination. It's the only way to try to address the so-called global imbalances, which were at the center of so many discussions before the crisis, which disappeared a bit during the crisis because we had other things to do, but are still there, and so coming back and headlines uh, after the crisis. And this question of uh, countries having big current account surpluses and countries having big current account deficit, creating tensions, and the way to solve this kind of problem, even the crisis has provided some of the solution to the problem, uh, this question is the kind of question that has to be discussed and the G20 uh, uh, map, uh, mutual assessment program, is certainly a way to, to try to, to do it. Um, on reform in the financial sector also cooperation is needed. Many countries are now approaching the problem from different directions and there is a great risk of uncoordinated policy, distorted capital flows and regulatory arbitrage. Um, look, one of the problems we have to face during this crisis was the question of a cross-border resolution with large financial institutions uh, coming from one country, having subsidiaries in uh, countries having problems, and dealing with their own problem in their own way, which is understandable. But it was also clear that if all of this uh, big financial institution deal with their own problem separately, we will create more problems than solve the problem. And the coordination and, uh, of what can be done maintaining exposure, not withdrawing the, the, the resources, which is something which took place with an initiative called at the beginning the Vienna Initiative and then a more uh, which uh, has been uh, enhanced and become, has become something uh, uh, managed by the European Commission itself and it worked rather well. This attempt was ad hoc. The question is, are we able to build cross-border resolution uh, uh, system that uh, will be uh, permanent and that will be effective as, as, uh, uh, as soon as uh, possible in, in case of, of, of crisis. The last point I would like to make is that um, we need also coordination and cooperation to be able to build a better crisis financing instruments. Part of the crisis is solved in the most fragile countries by IMF support. It has been the case in many countries, but those countries are very different. And when we created a new facility called the Flexible Credit Line used by uh, Mexico, Poland, uh, Colombia, it was the, uh, the idea which was behind this was to create something which will be able to serve a new category of countries. Countries having problems, not because of their own policy, but because of the environment in which they are, and for which the IMF wouldn't ask for any kind of change in the policy, because the, they had the right policy in place, just they were hit by a global crisis. So the more they were in a global economy, and I think that now everybody understands this, the more we need to have tools which are not only adapted to the reality of the country, but also likely to take into account the fact that the country may be hurt by the economic uh, environment. So 
Creating this new kind of tools needs also a better cooperation among countries. We are working hard to try to refine further this kind of, of tool and uh, to be able, because nobody can believe that there won't be any crisis anymore, so we don't know when, we don't know how, but there will be other crisis, to be able to, uh, since the beginning of the crisis, to provide uh, support to different kind of countries having different kind of, uh, of problems. Let me conclude with two remarks. The first one is that drawing the lessons of this crisis uh, will take time, but I, I see at least two important constants. The first one is that, uh, as I just say, the crisis of tomorrow will be different from the previous one, and we're always looking in backward when we try to fix problems. We look at what has uh, messed up in the previous crisis, but the next crisis will be different. Nevertheless, we have no other way but trying to improve uh, our early warning system. And frankly, uh, we haven't been good in uh, announcing and preventing crisis. So obviously, working on early warnings, which is not as simple as having green lights and red lights, but trying to see what kind of uh, consequences a, a problem, a default in one country may, uh, because of the spillover, because of the in interlinkages, may create in other countries around and try to have scenario uh, uh, likely to help us to foresee what may happen if is something on which we're working hard. And I think that uh, the early working exercise that we are uh, in doing now is much better than what we had before, still needs to be uh, enhanced, but that's a very important thing. Uh, it's fine to have tools to try to uh, uh, solve a crisis when you have the crisis, is as good or even better to try to foresee what may happen. So first thing is trying to improve the instrument we have to have signal from a uh, different part of the world that really we have a problem, or we may have a problem uh, in this direction or in other direction. Uh, the second thing is, uh, you won't be surprised, is that uh, uh, the international policy cooperation will need to grow. And really I'm concerned by the fact that uh, when you had uh, 20, 20 something, because the G20 is a little more than 20, but uh, 20 head of states in London in uh, last April or in Pittsburgh uh, last September, uh, they were scared enough to have the will to work together. But uh, now they're less squared, which is not that good, and so they're all going back to their own problem. It's a bit unfair to say that. The momentum is still there, but not as strong as it was, and really I think it's very important including for the academic community to stress this point that uh, we need to uh, have this process uh, going um, alive. We need to have this kind of a discussion taking place, even if we're not, or if we will not be in, a, in one year anymore in a, at the climax of a crisis, but we need to have a place, the G20 can be this, and that's a question of, and it raises the question of legitimacy that you we're uh, quoting, it can be the G20, can be a, another body, that's another discussion, but there must be a place where uh, multilateral discussion take place. And there's, we, had, we were lucky this time that uh, we could uh, put together everybody uh, soon enough to go in the same direction. Uh, it would be even better if this kind of uh, process is uh, somewhat institutionalized. That's the first concluding remark. The second one, of course, is that uh, we're here at the place where, at King's, where Keynes worked. I guess that during the last two days, uh, the spirit of Keynes has to be present in your discussion, and I want myself also to acknowledge the tremendous contribution that he made. Not, not that much thinking about the theoretical analysis of the general theory, but on another side, which is less often quoted, which is his uh, uh, dedication to multilateralism. He was one of the founding fathers of the, of, the, of the IMF, and this idea 
basic idea, which is at the roots of the IMF, and that Keynes uh, had very strongly uh, uh, described and supported, that economic stability and financial stability was the condition for avoiding social unrest, with social unrest threat to democracy, and from threat to democracy, risks of war, that this link has to be uh, uh, cut, that we had to avoid any kind of economic instability, and that what that was at stake was not only economic instability, but at least peace. And so the idea that multilateral institutions like the IMF, and especially uh, the, the IMF, are finally institutions where the ultimate goal is to help building peace uh, is something that what are in the ideas of the, the founding phase of fathers, and uh, clearly the, the crisis has validated this, uh, this mandate. So because it was Keynes' belief that economic policy can improve uh, people's life, let us draw inspiration from this belief and, and work together uh, and try to push everybody to work together in a new spirit of uh, global cooperation to foster growth, economic growth that will be uh, stronger, stable, and, and sustainable. That's what I think we need to secure our well-being, and that uh, is what we must strive for. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for that. those very inspiring and also very fact-based remarks. But uh, I do want to take note of the comment that I made in introducing our keynote speaker, that he is uh, indeed a cool under fire, and, the, and in the fact that he's in the midst of so much uh, uh, controversy, uh, it's a tribute to the clarity uh, with which he presents uh, his remarks. Um, we have time for about uh, three uh, questions, and I want to make a, a brief comment, which is that the question and answers will be off the record, uh, and then the, there's a press embargo until 3 p.m., uh, and then at that point the remarks will be, uh, uh, will be released. Yes, back there, the first hand to go up, right back, yes. Yep, please. Macro, ask more precisely what international macroeconomic policy coordination might consist of. All of us think that the global imbalances issue is difficult. All of us have watched the failure of IMF multilateral surveillance over the last five years. All of us have watched the US do what it wants to do and China and East Asia do what they want to do. And all of us know that this has to be fixed, and none of us know how it's going to be fixed. Have you got anything you could say about that? <laughs> well, let, let's take this, the, the example you take of the global imbalances. What happens during the crisis? Um, and the, Chinese side, the kind of uh, stimulus they implemented finally represents a shift, and an important shift, which is far from being totally completed, from a totally or almost totally export-led growth model to a more domestic-led growth model, which creates a lot of problems, it's going to take a long time, but clearly is now the choice made by the Chinese authority. Of course, this goes, is consistent with a higher value of the currency. And so the point is not to threaten the Chinese, telling them that uh, they're bad guys if they don't change their behavior. It won't work. I do believe it won't work. And in some respect, what you say was exactly this, that uh, big countries, whether the US or others, do what they want. The problem is to convince them that it's their own interest to follow this, to go follow this route. And I think that they are, takes time, but they are more and more convinced that uh, that's the right way for them to achieve their goals. At the same time, in the US, uh, and of course, the revaluation of the renminbi is part of correcting those imbalances. 
On the other side, in the U.S., global imbalances are not only China-U.S. problem, but that's the main part of it. Uh, in the U.S., uh, an amazing fact during the crisis, I don't know if it will last very long, but is the increase in the saving rate. Uh, is it temporary or uh, are the, uh, is the behavior of, of uh, U.S. household changing? That's the question. But let's imagine that it will last some time, then of course, higher saving, less deficit, less current account deficit. Then on both sides, you have a reduction of the surplus on one side and a reduction of the deficit on the other side. So you have some changes which take place during the crisis. Back to your question. Can this be discussed by the, 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 the party at stake? Uh, are, are they likely to understand both that uh, they have no interest in uh, going too far in a situation which creates tension because they will both, will, both of them will lose. I do believe it's possible. Again, this kind of uh, common understanding was possible during the crisis. Of course, it's a challenge to be sure that it can be done uh, in, 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 in quiet times, even if we're not really back uh, so far yet to, 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 to quiet times. It's a challenge. I think that uh, the Chinese are keen to play their role, of course they want a big role, but to play their role in, in the multilateral uh, discussion, and I don't want to be anymore uh, out of the system. And if so, the linkages between what they're doing and the rest of the economy and the, the global economy, they will have to take them into account. And my experience with the Chinese leader during the last year is that they're moving at their own pace, but they're moving in this direction. So yes, the answer is yes, I do believe it's possible to have this kind of uh, multilateral uh, um, or organization or overarching uh, institution trying to help countries to uh, take into account what the other are doing as a reaction of what they are doing and see if finally they're sure that it's in their interest to go this route or follow another route. And if I'm right, then in the coming year or in the coming two years, we will see a discussion taking place on this and uh, some results in the reduction of those, uh, those imbalances. And I, I really do believe that it's a better route than the one uh, relying on, uh, you know, uh, speeches, uh, s uh, trying to uh, accuse uh, uh, the other guy, uh, the other side of the table of doing the bad, the, the wrong thing, but finally was almost no result. Joe Stiglitz. Uh, a, con a, a couple examples about three countries that are partly illustrative of general principles. Uh, one of them is Latvia, uh, a country uh, where there's uh, a small open economy with a very large adjustment need, which is facing uh, enormous unemployment. Uh, is there an alternative model of, uh, for them to face to the current one which is basically an extraordinary deflationary strategy which is uh, killing them uh, and their people. Uh, and uh, I mentioned it partly because many people are interested in Latvia, but also you, you talked about increasing deficits going forward and it's sort of an extreme case of, of a problem that many other countries will face. Second country, uh, Spain, uh, a country that had a surplus before the crisis, a budget surplus, did everything right, uh, better regulation, financial regulation than the United States, and yet, you know, right now one out of two young people are unemployed. Uh, Greece doesn't represent the magnitude of the kind of problem that Spain does, uh, and yet the approach of Europe to solving Greece, uh, which is to not really doing anything adequate, if it's applied, continue to apply, really represents, I think, problems for Europe. What, what is your view and what can, should Europe uh, do? And the final one, talked about just mentioning the uh, global imbalances on the part of China. Germany's surplus as a percentage of GDP is larger than China. Uh, and many people think that its surplus is really part of Europe's problem. 
and yet there is again no adjustment mechanism uh, and that they are the real beneficiary of the failure of exchange rates to adjust uh, this issue of coordination that you've raised, how do you, how do you bring that about in, in the face of that kind of uh, lack of cooperative behavior? So you told me we're under Chatham House rules. <laughs> yes. Good. And I, I repeat that for everybody's benefit. We're under Chatham House rules here. Latvia. The solution is a bad, which has been implemented is a bad solution. The right solution would have been to devaluate the LAT. The idea that they can go on with a peg with the euro is an idea we fight against. It's public. It's not, some, um, it's not no, no big news. But not only the Europeans, but the Latvians themselves wanted to keep this because all political party in Latvia had go to election for years saying we're going to join the EU in 2012. So no one wanted to say the country now. So there was a kind of unified front of the Latvian on one hand, the Europeans on the other hand, saying we're not going to uh, change the peg. Then, of course, uh, when you can't uh, uh, follow this route, the only thing which remains to go back on tracks as fiscal adjustment was the huge deflation you, you're talking about. Another way would have been to say, fine, you want to keep the peg and it applies, it may apply to other countries, uh, but that means that you're part of uh, our community. And if you're part of our community, then it's our role to try to help you. And then to organize the way to have not only at the European level, structural funds which are supposed to correct in the long term uh, structural to help for structural reforms, but to have a short term a stabilization fund which would help countries at the same time to keep the peg of other countries being in the euro, which is almost the same thing, and to face a, a stabilization which is needed without having all the weight of that on their own shoulders, which obviously means at the end deflation. Right. This mechanism doesn't exist. And that's part of what I had in mind when I said uh, in my remarks that what uh, Europe, uh, Europe needs under the you know, uh, very uh, abstract word of economic government facing the, the single currency, which is an abstract speech, but if you want to be more pragmatic, it's some kind of institution likely to uh, compensate the, the, the damage caused by to some economy compared to others because of the of the single currency the single currency brings a lot of benefits to the, to the system as a whole but individually you may have problem uh, obvious and then you need to have a mechanism not only saying we are have a we want to express our solidarity but to do it really so the need of this kind of institution in my view is absolutely uh, evident Maybe this crisis will uh, have some good uh, outcome, which is to make people realize, after 10 years after the launching of the euro, that the process is not completed, and that it will be completed only when this kind of uh, stabilization tool, call it the way you want, will be, will be in place. But now it does, it's not the case. And so we at the IMF, for instance, dealing with Latvia, had no, no other choice than providing resources and helping them to go back on, uh, on, on, uh, on a sustainable fiscal situation. What is really surprising with Latvia is that uh, they're doing well, at least on the fiscal side, and they, but they're doing very badly on the economic side. And when you, uh, it goes together, of course, and when you discuss with the Latvian government today, they tell us, we told you, we're going to be tough, our people are used to this uh, for historical and political reasons, so they will accept it and uh, there won't be social unrest. We, we will be able to do it. I doubt it at this time. I'm not sure that it was the best way to, 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 to do it, but they did it. So the Latvian case for this, from this point of view is very interesting. It's very interesting also for another reason. 
which is that one of the reasons why the Europeans, especially the Commission, the ECB, the member state, didn't want to accept a change in the peg was because they were afraid about uh, of spillover to the rest of Europe. So I'm not going to uh, discuss if there was a real, uh, a real threat of spillover or not, but this question in principle of spillover from one small country. Latvia is a $30 billion economy, a small economy, but this small economy is likely to, likely to, it's not sure of course, would have been likely to create a lot of damages around, and that was the problem that, the, which the Europeans were facing, but also, it's also one of the reasons why this kind of a stabilization fund is even more needed. So what is true for a country having a peg can also be analyzed in the same way for countries inside the Euro, of course. Uh, what you said about Spain is absolutely right. It's a country which, where, where unemployment is already very high, and I'm not quite sure that the deflation policy is the right thing they need. But again, uh, to avoid this, the European Union has to make a step forward. And hopefully, this crisis will be an occasion to, 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 to do it. Now, uh, your third point is a difficult political point, especially for a Frenchman. <laughs> um, let's put it that way. You can't be a, a grocer selling your stuff to people who are obliged to borrow to buy you what you're selling and be happy making money because you sell the, you, what you have to sell and then tell the people you're bad guys because you're in debt. So uh, at one point in time, uh, more balanced growth within the border of the European Union are needed too. When you look at the global level, the Eurozone is balanced and has no contribution uh, no, no, neither de surplus or deficit, so not contributing to global imbalances. But within the European Union, certainly this question is a question which needs to be, to be discussed. On the other hand, it's difficult to tell people, the German, which are making efforts in terms of, uh, you know, uh, moderating uh, compensation, uh, having high productivity, and that uh, they shouldn't be the, the good pupils they are that it should do, not do work as well as they're doing. So that's why it's not that easy, and it's a difficult discussion. But again, it's a discussion of coordinating growth and productivity and, at the end, unemployment in, in the different parts of, of the union. And we go back always to the same thing, that uh, if you are accepting to get rid of one of the adjustment tool, namely the currency, and you right, the European rightly do so, and I've always been a strong supporter of this, and I think that the Euro, for many other reasons, is a huge achievement for the European Union. But if you do that, then you need, at the same time, to build the tools to uh, be able to do what you can't do with the currency. And the problem is that we're just in the middle of this. Well, I'm going to exercise the prerogative of the chair and thank our distinguished speaker for his eloquence, his courage, and the amount of information that he's provided, and also to give him a chance perhaps to have a small uh, bite of lunch along with everyone else here. Um, thank you so much. Please join me again in thanking Dominique Strauss-Kahn for his wonderful speech.